When people you. say I don't have time, you're fucking lying. Exactly. You just don't want it that way. Exactly. I had a sick kid in the hospital. I was working 60 hours a week as a CPA. I had a side hustle business as a photographer. Don't give me that shit that you don't have time. Right. It's just not a priority. I think the biggest thing is you will never outperform yourself in much. Because the reality is, is most small businesses aren't really businesses. They're just jobs that are run by somebody. Clip that one. Welcome to Behind the Rise podcast hosted by the Perino Brothers. My name is Angelo and I'm joined by my brothers and business partners, Lucho and Valentino. On this show, we will speak to successful local, national and global entrepreneurs, as well as discuss lessons we've learned in our 15 year career building a nine figure organization. We're in the middle of our journey now and want to share with you all the wins, losses and lessons learned behind the rise. Guys, today we have a very special guest, one of my good friends, um, actually my neighbor, and uh, overall great guy, Michael Shogren. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, so I'm gonna give you guys a little um, little bio about Mike, and then we'll get right into the story. So Michael is the host of the Short-Term Rental uh, Secrets podcast and founder of Short-Term Rental Secrets Mastermind, a mentorship and mastermind program that helps investors launch, automate, and scale their short-term rental portfolios. Michael and his wife, Kristen, founded a national short-term rental investment and management company in 2017 as a vehicle to build passive income so they could stop trading away time from family for a paycheck. Huge point. Huge point. That vision came to fruition within 18 months when their short-term rental portfolio replaced their income. Kristen and Michael both left their corporate jobs. They're based out of Boston, Mass, and currently have a portfolio of 100 short-term rental units across five states, including three boutique hotels in the Boston uh, North Shore area. A lot. A lot, lot was done in a short short period of time. 18 months is the most impressive thing for me when you told me before we got on here. 18 months is crazy. Crazy. And, and Mike's story, you know, Mike and Kristen's story is really, really something special. So we're really excited to get into it. Um, there's a lot, a lot of takeaways. We just talked for about an hour. I wish we recorded it because we got so much out of it. So we're going to try to get <laughs> we'll, it right we'll back. We'll recap. Yeah, a little <laughs> recap. So, all right, Mike, so basically let's get into it. Like, what were you, you know, where did you grow up? Like, what were you like in high school? Like, you know, how did you end up where you are now? Let's, let's bring us through the timeline. Yeah, so I mean, I grew up in Central Mass, just outside of Worcester. Um, I was an athlete, you know, I played football, lacrosse. Uh, I've got a younger brother and um, I was kind of, I was a lot like my son, actually. I was very mm. quiet, very, uh, very quiet kid growing up. And then once I got into high school, I kind of like completely flipped and turned into like kind of almost a stereotypical jock, and, okay. you know, getting in a lot of fights and screwing around and whatever, but I always got good grades. Like mm. it was like, everybody always told me like, go to school, get good grades and like go get a good safe job. Yeah. You know, great parents, both super hardworking, blue collar. Like my dad's an elevator guy. My mom worked a bunch of different jobs when we were growing up, always had enough on the table, always made us, comfortable and went above and beyond to like put us in private school and do all these different things for us and just really instilled like you can do anything if you want it bad enough and you work hard enough for mm. it and nothing in this world is free and so i had the hard work down and um ended up playing football like i said i played lacrosse um ended up going to bryant university at the time it was bryant college for mm. a year yeah good and, school uh, yeah, they had a really good lacrosse team. That was like my goal. Ever since I was 14, I went to like a, a summer camp there for like lacrosse. Yeah. And I was like, I want to go here. This place is sick. And made that happen. Went there. <clears throat> went there for a year. Ended up getting kicked out just because I was a complete booze bag and getting in the really? fights all the time. <laughs> no shit. No yeah. not shit. expect yeah. that wow. at yeah. all. Yeah. So it's, it's funny, Adam, right? Because it's like I was a completely, like if I met Kristen back then, she would have she would have hated me. Like yeah. I was a complete screw up. Um and uh, yeah, so I ended up quitting drinking back. This is back 2006. So I haven't had a drink since 2006. Oh, no okay. Yeah. So put put the plug in the jug, as they say. And I'm yeah. like, all right, I gotta get my shit. Right. I gotta get my shit together. So got kicked out of Bryant. Took uh, whatever it was, six months off. The next semester off, working overnight at UPS loading trucks. And during the day, I was working at American Eagle, stocking shelves in the back and whatever, just doing whatever I could, make some cash. And then fortunately, my high school lacrosse coach moved 
and got a job as the head lacrosse coach at Assumption. Mm -hmm. And he pulled a bunch of strings to get me into Assumption. <clears throat> and so I get I transferred to Assumption, small Catholic school in Worcester. And uh, my first weekend there, a bunch of my high school buddies went there. Mm. First weekend there, start partying, and uh, I hadn't drank in a long time. Mm. Ended up getting shattered. Mm. And uh, almost got kicked out of Assumption. Like wow. literally first weekend there. So I'm like, wow. all right. Now, like, I am done. I caused an absolute scene. It was it was a hot mess. Mm. We don't need to go down that. I kind of want to hear it, to be honest. Do you really, really want to hear this? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was bad. It was, it was bad. bad. Yeah. I just broke out in handcuffs. Mm. Bad. Got it. Right? So, like, it was, it was some crazy shenanigans. Yeah. Um, and I swear the only reason I ended up, like, getting back into school was because, like, the campus police and the Worcester police just, like, threw me the beat down of a lifetime. Mm. Yeah. And I swear that's the only reason I got back into school. Mm. Yeah. So, that... In the, it's funny, man, because like there's these certain moments in your life that at the time feel like complete rock bottom, but they're like the catalyst for massive change in your life. Yep. Like yep. it absolutely sucks and like it feels like your whole world is ending. But there have been a few times like that that has happened in my life that just like completely changes the trajectory of everything. Hmm. So like at that point, I was like, all right, I'm done. Got my shit together, took the next semester off, ended up going back to Assumption the next year. So this is... January 2006 is when I stopped. So 2007, go back to Assumption. End up meeting Kristen there. Got my shit together, played lacrosse there. Ended up graduating, got a job as an accountant. I was always good with math. My mm. teacher's like, you should be a CPA. Like, you're good with math. You'll make a good income. You'll probably make partner in like 15 years and you'll be set. I'm like, all right, whatever. It makes sense. Yeah. And uh, started doing that and I was good at it. <clears throat> but then I started seeing kind of like what that life was going to look like. And, you know, I could grind with the best of them, yeah. but I was just looking at what that trajectory was going to look like. And I'm like, I don't think I want that lifestyle yeah. for, you know, a lot of people getting divorced and whatever, and like not seeing their kids. And I'm like, there's gotta be a different way to do this. Yeah. But I didn't, I had never met a millionaire. At least I didn't know any millionaires. So I was mm. like, I don't know. So I ended up leaving there, went, took a corporate job at uh, national grid Worked in their finance department for years. And then I was, something told me, it was like, if I could just get around some like street smart millionaires, like I I feel like I could do something. Hmm. Like I feel like I could go a different way. And so I joined a mastermind group where like the whole, their whole pitch was like, you're going to get mentored by like street smart millionaires hmm. and learn how to become financially free. So I was like, okay, sign me up. And, um, it, it completely changed my life again. It was like, wow, like these, these are just regular people. Most of them, you never even know like how wealthy they are, but they're just like, dude, you you got the wrong formula. Like the whole go to school, get good grades, get a good job, put 10% in a 401k and like retire at 62. They're like, that's all bullshit. That ain't, I mean, you can do that if you want, but like those stats do not add up if right. you really want to retire off right. of a 401k. So like, that's not the route. So I knew after a while with these dudes, real estate was going to be the vehicle. Hmm. But if I'm being honest, man, it was like, I was comfortable. Like right. I had a good six figure salary. Kristen had a nice salary. Like we had the nice house, couple yeah. of cars, like, you know, we were comfortable, which I think is probably the most dangerous place you can be. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's for sure. So next major life event comes in and really kicks me in the teeth. So when our son was born, I was telling you guys, he's six now almost seven, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. But when he was born, he was born with a very rare lung disease. And uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you the, the, the full story here. Might as well. We wake up one morning, we're about to do his newborn photos, right? So like we're both pumped and get the photographer lined up, all this stuff. And I go to, to get him out of his crib or whatever. And I'm like, something looks off. Like he just looked really pale. His lips were kind of blue and whatever. So we were like, you know what, we should probably just take him to the doctor. Like something looks off. So we canceled mm -hmm. that and we start driving to the, um, to the, to his doctor and, uh, he falls asleep and all of a sudden like, we can't wake him up. Holy shit. Oh, shit. And so Kristen's like, I can't wake him up. And so I'm driving like a hundred miles an hour down route one. She's on the phone with an ambulance and we meet him at, uh, Kelly's roast beef on route one, like, wow. like rendezvous with this ambulance. Cause like, I cannot wake this kid up. Mm. And, end up taking them to children's hospital in Boston and they do all these different tests. And, uh, 
like, oh, we think it's this very rare lung disease. We're going to send his blood tests over to Hopkins and they're going to do all this analysis, whatever. So we end up spending weeks at a time there. And at a certain point, like I ran out of vacation time. I ran out of sick time. I've got all these hospital bills piling up and I'm like, I'm going to have to leave Kristen and my son here Mm. and go back to a desk to trade time for money because I can't afford to be here anymore. And I was just crushed, man. Like I just felt like the biggest piece of shit. Like Mm. when the time when my family needs me the most and I can't be here, like something's got to change. So I told her that day, I said, I have no idea how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to build us a business that gives us the income we want without ever trading time for money again. And then I met a guy in that mastermind group who was doing Airbnbs and short term rentals. And I, it just made sense. It was like, you know, your traditional rental might make you two, three, 400 bucks a month. I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like, I'm going to need a shitload of properties (laughs) to get out of here. But he was doing like 1500 to two grand a month per property. I'm like, wow, like this is the fast lane. And so we gave it a shot. I didn't have any cash. So I pulled a loan out of the 401k I was contributing to. Yeah. Had enough for a down payment on a little two bedroom condo up in North Conway. And then I got a 0% interest credit card to fund the renovations and furnishing it. And then uh, we launched that in, we bought at the end of 2017, launched it the beginning of 2018. And just like that dude said, like it would cash flow like 1500 bucks a month, like net after everything. And we would use it every single month as a family, which was sick. So I was like, okay, this business model works, but I'm tapped out. I got nothing left in the 401k that I can pull from. I have no more funds. I can't live off 1500 bucks a month. How the hell do I keep going? Right. And so <clears throat> I'm a numbers guy. The numbers make sense. I'm a shitty salesman, mm. right, at the time. Yeah. So I'm like, I just got to find these these investors like around North Shore that have these small multis. And I'm like, dude, if you just convert it and start renting it by the night, I'll design it, I'll build it out, I'll run everything for you. You can make way more money. Mm. And so I started approaching these people, hitting them up on Craigslist or Zillow or whatever when they were listing their places for rent. And I didn't know how to pitch anything. Like I just, I must've sounded like a jackass yeah. for yeah. a while. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I, at the time I was doing that, I was telling everybody I knew like what I was doing and just trying to network as much as I could. I started hosting a local, I called it Airbnb Mastery, a local meetup at the Capital One and Market Street. They would let me use their little back room once a month wow. for free. Mm. And so I started hosting this meetup And I was like, I'm going to, somebody's going to say yes. Like, I just need to keep showing up. And I did that for nine months. Wow. Nine months. And there were three months straight that not a single person showed up to that meetup. Wow. It was just me and my whiteboard and my little video camera and all this stuff. And like, I could feel the energy from the people working at Capital One. Like, damn, like, they just felt bad for me. They were just like, this guy doesn't give up. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, cool. I'll see you guys next month. And then eventually uh, I met a guy that um, gave me a shot Mm. and he was like, okay, like this makes sense. He's like, I don't want to do shit, Mm -hmm. but if this is legit, like I'll give you a shot. Yeah. And um, it just snowballed. Then he introduced me to somebody else and then they introduced me to somebody else. And then it just started snowballing and we, we delivered, like we got them the results that we were talking about. And that's how after that it was all word of mouth. Mm. And we were in five different states with 15 doors within a year of that. Wow. And how did you get them results? Like, can you explain that process like a little bit? Like what the model was? Like, yeah. Like yeah. What so the like model as an was, example, like- right? So as an example, there was a two bed in Salem, right? That was renting out for two grand a month. <clears throat> that property, I still manage it to this day, brought in over a hundred grand in wow. 2022. Wow. So, so you so said, it, okay, you own the property, right? So he already owned the property. I'm going to come in there. I'll design it. I'll give you the pitch, right? So like from an investor standpoint, I'm a numbers guy. So I'm like, all right, listen, say you invest 10 grand to furnish this property. If I can make you just even another 500 bucks a month, that's six grand a year. That's a 60% cash on cash return on your 10 grand. Are you getting 60% on your money anywhere else? Fuck no. Hell no. Nobody's getting that kind of return, right? So like took me a while to kind of finesse that pitch. But when you're talking to investors... And that makes sense. And then I would just lay out like, here's how we're going to do it. Here's how I'm going to take better care of your property than any tenant you've ever had. Right. How many of your tenants have had a cleaning crew go in there and professionally deep clean and sanitize your property? Right. Never. We're going to do that multiple times a week. Because if your property doesn't look mint, I don't make any money. 
Right. So we're going to take better carrier property. We're going to put noise monitoring in there. We're going to put Wi-Fi locks on there. We're going to put security cameras on there. I'm going to know everybody that's in that property at all times. And there's not going to be any shenanigans. And uh, we're just going to make you way more money. Yeah. What a pitch. And then I'm you in. Ta- and I'm then you, sold. Yeah, I'm sold too. <laughs> yeah. And then you take a percent. That's yeah. how it works. So yeah. they're making eight grand a month. You take a percent. And then they make the spread, essentially. The difference yeah. between the... Okay. And it's like... It sounds egotistical sometimes when I say this. But it, like, if you think of it this way, it's like being the Warren Buffett of real estate, like Warren Buffett makes people more money than they would make on their own. Right. Right. So like even after my cut, if I'm making them way more money than they can make on their own, they don't care how much I'm making. Exactly. Fact. Or if they do, then they're not the ideal client for me. Cause if you're too worried about how much I'm pulling in for my work, right. I don't need to work with you. That's right. Quite frankly. Yeah. That's don't right. count my money. I hate that. Yeah. yeah. So it just started growing. And then at that point, that same investor, that first one, he found the uh, the first hotel deal up in Rockport mm. and he brought it to me and he was like, hey man, do you think your systems would work at scale on like a commercial deal, like a hotel? And I went out and checked it out with him and I was like, yeah, like I think this would absolutely work. Mm. And I said, but if we do this, I don't want a management fee, I want ownership. Yeah. And he was like, okay. So him and his partner brought all the money <clears throat> and I was just the operations guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, we bought that property February 10th, 2020, right before COVID. Yeah. Closed on it. Literally for, right before. It was a month, like yeah. weeks before yeah. COVID. Closed on it. We bought that for 2.25, put 600 into it to like renovate it. So they're into it for about a million bucks cash. 18 months later to the day, it appraised at five and a half million. Wow. We wow. refinanced, pulled all their cash out and some. Wow. And uh, we still own that property now and it just absolutely crushes. Right. And it still has cash flow and yeah. even with the additional uh, uh, debt taken out. Yeah. That's the, that's the fucking, that's the way to do it right there. Yeah. Beautiful formula. Yeah. So, okay. So when you were, when you were like going out and doing these things at, at Capital Grill, I think you said, right? Capital One. Oh, like the bank. Oh, Capital They're One, little, the bank. The I thought it was like a restaurant. No, no, no. no, no. Like a, it was a bank Dude. The rum. Oh, yeah. shit. I thought it was like a back of a restaurant type thing. Yeah. Okay. So even worse. All right, yeah. Capital. Yeah. So you were doing that, right? In a lonely room, like no music playing with yeah. your, your thing. So you're doing that, but you're still working full time. Yeah. Right? You're still, you know, trading time for money, working. Yeah. You know, you need When to people keep... say I don't have time. Right. You're fucking lying. Exactly. You just don't want it bad enough. Exactly. I can't stand that excuse. Exactly. I had a sick kid in the hospital. I was working 60 hours a week as a CPA. I had a side hustle business as a photographer. Don't give me that shit that you don't have time. Right. It's just not a priority for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're not, you're not doing it with intent. You're not, yeah. you're not making it your, your mission to do. So you're doing that. You finally found someone who gave you a shot. Then it snowballed from it snowballed and, and it was word of mouth to get more and more of these, right? And then you're saying within 18 months you were doing that, and then you say, okay, let's do the numbers. Now we have enough income to replace what we were doing before. Yeah. My number was 15 grand a month. I needed to replace 15 grand a month yep. to leave. Yeah. To get us both out, like that was it. And so those are my marching orders. And it was like I want to get to 15k a month. And once the properties are live, I want to build the SOPs and systems and automation so that I'm not working more than two hours a week on that business. Because again, like the money's great, but if it's like, if I'm giving myself another job, what's the point? Right. So I was just ruthless with creating process and systems and figuring out all the software and the automation so that like I can con- consistently give a good product to the owners, to the guests that doesn't require me to trade time for money. Because that was the whole point, the whole marching order from the beginning. Yep. So SOPs, uh, standard operating procedure for, you know, you know, that's like the acronym for that. But like that whole thing, like trading time for money, really becoming efficient with your time. Like that's not common knowledge for people, right? That's like something that you learn along the way. So where are you getting this information? I know you mentioned masterminds, like is it books, masterminds, like what was it? Because that's not common, a common thing to know, you know? I think part of my advantage was I was an auditor for 10 years yeah so like i was going into companies like auditing how they were doing stuff and i was like you could be way more efficient by doing it this way yeah so like that was my trade so like i just laid into that when i was building all this up and i was you know i read books like the e-myth revisited by Mm -hmm. michael gerber highly recommend that book yeah um and just really learning how to create process and just think through how do I build this so that it doesn't rely on me? Because the reality is, is most small businesses 
aren't really businesses. They're just jobs that are run by somebody. Like right. you own a job. And that's if that's what you want, that's cool. But there's a very key distinction. And I remember a mentor of mine said to me one time when I was telling him about the photography business, he's like, it's cool, but that's not a business. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm, I'm making money for myself like without a job. He's like, yeah, you own a job, boss. That's not a business. Right. And so <clears throat> this was back in like 2014. This is before all the, the crazy stuff. And I was like, okay, then I'm going to figure out how to do this. And so I, I hired a girl, an intern for a summer. She worked for me for free. I sh- taught her how to take the pictures, how to edit the pictures, how to do the proposals, how to do everything. And just documented all of these SOP, their SOPs. But I don't want, if you're new to this, like, don't freak out. Like think of creating a Google doc with screenshots of like, all right, click this, click this, type this, do this. So like you could hand it to a fifth grader and they could do this. Exactly. It was like a manual, like a step-by-step guide to exactly. do every position in the company that, that you want to do. Yeah. Or one person's job description. Like we just did that for like the hiring process. So we made an SOP for, okay, when you're talking to a chef, all the questions to answer, you know, all the questions to ask, all the questions to answer, you know, exactly what the process is. Once you have the the person that you like, how to move them to the next stage. Once we did that, I used to spend all my time like calling and interviewing and doing all that. Once we put that SOP in place with someone to do, it completely freed up my time for then, for then now you're able to go do other stuff to work on the business and then and then duplicate that. And you can literally do SO- SOPs for everything. Yeah. Even with customer service on Nutrate, there's an SOP on how to respond to this, an SOP how to respond to this, an SOP on how to credit someone for certain issues. Like there's so much. Yeah, like do. examples. Like if somebody, can, you know, there's a problem with one of their meals, like what the right. options are. Like you can do A, B, or C, you know? Yeah. And uh, that has been, we like just learned that. I don't even think I knew what SOP was like eight months ago. Yeah. That like is the key first, to freedom, man. That's it, the key to time freedom. Right. Yeah, because so otherwise, true. even if you have staff, they're going to have to keep coming back to you for questions. Exactly. Exactly. You have to figure out a way to like re- make it completely sustainable and remove yourself exactly as much as possible. You know, like I, I think on the first or second episode, I, I mentioned that somebody said to us, "What well, you know, we do so many different businesses like us, you know, in like it looks like you have 32 hours in a day. Well, it's because we figured out the SOP thing, you know, and in this, you know, all these different procedures and stuff that allowed us to be able to do more because Previous to that, it was just a hundred problems, like each just coming to us. Like nobody could work independently without coming to us for a solution for that problem. Or nobody knew what the next step was, or they were afraid to make a mistake or all that. And the minute we learned that, we were like, holy shit, this is a game changer, you know? But, uh, you know, we didn't, we never really invested into ourselves, like with, um, you know, masterminds and groups like that. If we had 10 years ago or whatever it was, we would be, 10 times further than we are right now. And it's a, it's a huge unlock. Like if I have a kid, right. And they're going up to the education system and all this stuff. Like I would, I would almost want to urge them. Like when you're 18, 17 years old, join a mastermind instead of like paying 60,000 a year for college. I know like the amount of, the amount of takeaway from a mastermind of something specific that you want to do, or just a general like self-development techniques like that mastermind will get you more than three years of school. That's 160 $200,000. I know. So, so true. The big revelation I had, like I was always a good student. I had a 4.0 GPA in college. Like Mm. I was a good student, but I was so focused on getting the grades that I, I missed the real juice of college, which was making those connections. Right. Like that's, that's how the real world works. Right. Like my whole issue with the school system, and I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it's like they train you that you have to do everything. Right. But the way that the real world works is you have to find people to collaborate and work with and put the right people in the right seat on the bus. Otherwise, you're going to stay small. Right. It's so true. Like so, For so business true. ownership, for sure. I mean, obviously there's some, you know, I'm the same, I think the same way that you think about the education system, but I think the only good thing with the education is like, uh, um, like plumber or nursing or like doctors, lawyers, mm. like you have to go to school for that. But other than that, if you want to be like a salesperson or if you want to be like a business owner, I don't think there's much takeaway from the education system. No, it's really the only benefit is the networking, like you said, right. you know, networking and a little bit of maybe a little bit of knowledge. But if you just did networking and like some mastermind programs, you'd be right. way further ahead. But again, depending on, on the career path. All right, but back to the story, right? So now 18 months, you replace the income. You and your wife say, okay, let's make the leap. Now, 
in your in your like the way you explained the way you grew up, grew up right like your parents both work jobs like this is like a very foreign thing to do like 100%. no one you, that is close to your immediate family they're probably telling you like what are you crazy so my parents were always super supportive yeah and i will be forever grateful for that but that's why again the masterminds and like who you surround yourself with like i had friends that were like dude you're out of your mind like you're leaving a a safe good six figure income job to like go do this thing yeah and it's like if if those are the only people that are in your circle you got to have some big stones or like it's just going to make it really hard for you to keep pushing in the direction because it's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows right like the f- that's a fact <laughs> like the yeah I mean, you and I talk about it all the time. Like yeah. shit just goes sideways in business. Right. Like it just happens. And that's just part of life. As business owners, we solve problems. Like yeah. that's what we do. Right. But uh, if you don't have people in your corner that are going to support you, you're going to just going to constantly second guess yourself, especially at the beginning. Because yeah. it takes it takes guts to do that stuff. Yeah. So, um, but at the same time, I will never forget the day that like, I didn't even tell Kristen. So she mm. ended up leaving first. The plan initially was for me to leave first. Mm. But then... You know, once she went back to work after Kaden was getting a little bit better, they were asking her to travel more and all this stuff. And I was like, just tell them you're done. Like, yeah. you leave first. So she left first and it was like September of 2019. Hmm. And then uh, one day I was just doing my morning routine, did a little meditation and it just, it like came to me. It was like, today's your day. Hmm. I'm like, out of nowhere. And I was wow. just like, okay. So like, I literally drove, I was, I was driving in. I don't miss that commute down 95 to Waltham. Mm-hmm. That commute right. sucked. Yeah. Um, and I called my boss who was based in Brooklyn and I was just like, Hey man, you know, I've been doing this real estate stuff. Like I've gotten to the place where it's like, it's actually costing me money to, to come into the office now. Cause it's grown so much. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't do both. So I want to give you my notice. Now I'm happy to stay through the end of the year, help facilitate, facilitate a transition, do whatever I can. But if, you know, if you don't want that, that's fine. I understand. And I was terrified, man. Cause like mm. we were, we weren't quite at the number yet, right. but we had the hotel under contract. So I'm like, I hope he lets me work through the end of the year. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but he might not. Right. And so I just went for it. And it, the funny thing was, is he was like, man, I, I envy you. Mm. Wow. He's that's, like, I, that was his response. Yeah. Wow. He was like, that's really awesome, man. Like I'm, I'm proud of you and I'm happy for you, you know? And I think that's a big fear that a lot of people have of like, I don't want to tell my boss or I don't want to tell people at work, like what I'm doing in real estate or on the right. side or whatever. But I think if you're more open and transparent, transparent about it, you're going to find out that people like appreciate it. And they're like, man, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. He probably yeah. wishes he did that however many years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially in a corporate you know, job. He's probably been there for 20 something years, 30 years. He's like, you know what? Shoot your shot now while you're young or whatever. Take yeah. the risk. I wish I did. Yeah. So with, in terms of like skill set wise, so you're like the, the more numbers and math guy. So what is your wife skill set in the operation? Like how did you envision both you guys working together? So she's, she's the creative man. She's the interior designer. And now she's got a whole interior design business. She designs all these properties nationally at this point. Um, so she ran point on all of that. And then I ran all the operations and built the team. And now, like, I haven't talked to a guest in, I don't even years at this mm. point, right? Because we built the infrastructure. And again, thinking about who, another, another book plug, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan, phenomenal book. Mm. But it was like, who, who do I need on the bus that can take a lot of this stuff? So most of my team is based overseas in the Philippines. Mm. And they're phenomenal. Like they all used to work at Airbnb's call center. So yeah. they already know how to handle guest issues. We just had to train them up on our process, but they're all great with people. And I wasn't always great with people. Yeah. You know, I can be a little blunt. <laughs> yeah. So like they're great customer service type folks. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up bringing on Matt, who's like my operations manager now. And I think the big, where you really start to get time back is when you have that middle management level. Right. Because then all the staff are going to that person for questions instead of directly to you. Right. And I didn't know that, but I just, looking back, it was like, that's when I was like, wow, I'm really elevating myself out of this. Right. There's always that moment too of how much it's going to cost you too. Like, I feel like we've ran into that a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, but do we need it? You know, like, do we need to, we could still do it with, you know, we could take the questions and stuff like that. But the minute we started hiring those positions, 
that's when the revenue started accelerating because now it's like, okay, we're looking at shit from a different angle. Yeah. And we're just focusing on working on the business, bringing in more numbers, driving sales. Exactly. That's huge. Because when you're in it, you can't see a lot of that stuff. And like my team asked me, like, how do you catch this stuff so fast? And I'm like, it's because I'm not in the weeds. Right. Right, And so like I meet with my managers every single week. We've got a scheduled meeting where we go through all their issues. And then we have an all staff meeting where we review every KPI, every review from every property. And we just go through the weeds and any issues. So like we're just constantly making sure that the boat is moving in the right direction. So the I don't want to say like you should hire people as fast as possible but I think it depends on like how big you want to go right like again from the beginning like my whole point was to get to at least 15k so I could spend more time with my wife and my kid that was the original goal like that was it so like if you look at the last five six years now like we hit that goal and then it's just been like we've been adding a couple deals a year Right. Like I'm not aggressively going out and cranking out more and more and more properties because it's like, what's the point? Right. Like we hit the number and there's, there's always more. So I always ask people, what, what are we really trying to achieve? Cause you can go as big as you want, but it's like, why? Like, right. What is the goal? Like once you get pat- past a certain number, like, I don't know, my lifestyle hasn't really changed much right. in a while. Cause it's like, once you get past a certain number, it's like, it, it becomes less motivating. Right. You know? I, th- I think there's something to be said about you had that number of I need to get to 15 grand a month. Like I, I think most people, they don't have that. You know, it's like What's you kind of you just man? take take the punches as they come and you just like figure it out as you go. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But if you have that target, like you were working towards that the whole way, like that's a huge first step. Yeah. And then as soon as you got it, like boom. On right. And that level. brings us to a little bit what we were talking about earlier, earlier, which is like visualization and all that stuff. Like having intent. Like, you know, we talked about masterminds, personal development, right? And there's some people who go around and they just join, they read books like consistent, like all the time, like yeah, personal over, development books. You know? They over consume content, you know, and personal development content, going to these like, uh, you know, conferences or whatever, but they're not um, executing on, on what they're learning. They're not executing on the principles, right? So tell us a little bit about that. Like how has that imp- have been part of your strategy? Yeah, man. I mean, and I was definitely part of that little movement like the info junkie like you get the dopamine hit when you're learning all this yeah. new stuff right it like feels good but then it's like all right the rubber meets the road when you actually start acting on it right i could actually do some of these things yeah the the biggest the biggest results booster came for me when i really went into the personal development and started like you said lucho getting super clear on what the goal was And then being able to see myself hitting that goal i think the challenge that most people face and that I faced was like, we say we want financial freedom, right? I coach people, I run a mastermind. The first thing we ask, what do you want? Everybody says financial freedom. Yeah. What does that mean? Right. There's, there's levels to that. So like, what does that mean? What is your number? What does your lifestyle look like? Do you want to just buy an RV and fit it out and drive around the country? Or are you trying to like fly private to Portugal? I don't know. Like what is that number for you? So getting clear on that, but then, the real piece is, can you see yourself living that lifestyle? Because we all have this like internal thermostat. Dean Graciosi talks about it in his book, Millionaire Success Habits. So true. This little internal thermostat of like, before, you know, I was a 15K a month guy, yeah. right? To get to 50 or 100 or 200 a month, like you can't be this, you can't have that same thermostat, right? So you have to start to rewire what your self image looks like. So like really see asking myself, who is the guy that makes 15 grand a month on his own, 50 grand a month, hundred grand a month, whatever the number is like, who is that guy? How does he operate? How does he walk? How does he dress? What types of masterminds is he going to? Like what types of investments is he making? And just start being that person. And it sounds so cliche, man, but I'm telling you, if you do that and you start act like that person and be that person consistently, you will have the results. The results don't come. You don't become that person after you get the results. You get the results because you became that person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So So, tell me like practically, like, okay, you have a goal of hitting, let's say a hundred thousand a month, right? Yeah. Like, what do you, are you like, when you shower in the morning, visualizing it? Is it before you go to bed at night? Are you taking time out of your day to meditate? 
Yeah. Like, tell me exactly how to visualize. Because personally, that's my number one struggle in life. I can't visualize well right now. So and this, I just put it onto the universe. So I got to yeah, take gonna, that thing back. It's yeah. going to change now. It's yeah, going to exactly. change now. So. Up until now, as my mentor yeah. used to say. Up yeah. until now. Yeah. So there, the science shows that like... When right when you wake up and right before right as you're like dozing off to sleep, your I don't want to get too technical, but like your brain waves are in a state where you can have a direct connection to the subconscious. Mm. I forget if it's alpha or beta, one of those brain waves, whatever those are. Right when you wake up and right before you go to bed, you're in like the perfect mental space to just have a direct connection to the subconscious. And the subconscious is where everything happens. That's, That's where, where self ninety five percent everything. Do we automate on autopilot? So true. Like I went to the gym, I left and I knew that we were starting this at 11. I realized halfway there that I was just driving to Starbucks. Right. Didn't even, didn't even, like I was just on autopilot. Like that's just like my routine. Like I don't even that's think about program. it. It's like yeah. a software. It's exactly. literally like a computer software. Um, shit, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah, um, so. Oh, so practically yeah. on how to visualize, right? <laughs> yeah. So when I was really pushing for it after like this, idea came and like that realization from mentors about visual the importance of visualization so i keep my airpods on my nightstand next to the bed so like before my feet hit the ground my alarm goes off i reach over i grab my airpods and i have this like fifth uh, five minute like piano melody that just zends me out mm. and that way i know once the song's over i don't like the sound of an alarm to like snap me out of my visualization so i'll do it right before i get up I'll do it like mid morning, say 11 o'clock or whatever, then like two to three. And then same thing right before I go to bed. And I just so use four that times a day. Yep. Okay. For five minutes a piece. So 20 minutes a day. But what that does, and I'll get into like a specific example of what that would look like. Yeah. But what that does is one, it puts you back into that state of feeling like that person. Mm -hmm. There's a book by Neville Goddard called feeling is the secret. Right? A lot of people will do affirmations or write their goals down. But like if there's no feeling behind it, if you don't feel like yeah, there, you, you need, need to tie emotions it. to it. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't that doesn't come right away either. Right. Like it takes practice. I think sometimes like you start like I know it's, you know, one time we were talking about meditating a couple of years ago. It's like you don't feel it like I'm not I don't think it's working for me. But it's like it's like any other muscle. You got to work on it. And then little by little, you're starting to. Feelings are getting attached to it and it's starting to happen. It's like, you got to fake it till you make it almost, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so you, the visualization itself, you want it to be super detailed because the cool thing with your subconscious is, is it can't tell the difference between reality and like your imagination. Mm. Like it has, has no difference. And they've done studies on this where like they'll take a basketball team and like half of them will go shoot free throws for an hour a day. The other half will just visualize shooting free throws for an hour a day. And by the end of the study, the results are identical like the improvement wow. is like identical wow Holy shit so it's nuts right like your brain can't tell the difference and i did um at my event last year i did this from the stage where i like did a guided visualization and i basically just like had people like close their eyes and picture themselves in their kitchen at home and i'd have them walk around and do all this stuff and open the fridge and like grab a lemon out of the fridge cut it open and like take a bite out of the lemon and mm. you could i was like watching their face they'd be like like they could like <laughs> wow. taste the lemon. Wow, like, wow, wow. Because if you go to that level of detail, your brain can't tell the difference and you'll have a physiological response. Wow. So in the example we were talking about offline, mm -hmm. when I was going for that number, I was like, okay, well, what is that going to look like? How am I going to know when I actually hit that goal? Where am I going to be? So I'm like, all right, I'm probably going to be at my desk in my office, looking at my monitor, checking this software that shows me my financials. So like I would just hone in on that. I'm like, okay, I'm seeing my number on that screen. Yeah. Just as it would look. I mean, you could even take a screenshot, throw it in Canva and change the number for like a vision board if you want. Yep. But it's like, I see that number and then I let that emotion come over me, that pride and that excitement of like, I fucking did it. Yeah. And then I, I'd see myself get up. Like I could feel my desk. I could smell like the scent that I have in like my office. Like it was like, I'm there. Bring in all your emotions. And then I saw myself get up, walk out, go up, start talking to Kristen, tell her about it, see how excited she is. And then at one point, like I would see Caden come in there and he'd be like, what did you do? Like, and just, we'd laugh about it and whatever, but it was like real, like I was there and I would just do that over and over again on this loop. And then it was within, it was less than two months, man. It was like 
that's and tripled our results fast right yeah like if you do it right and you get emotionally involved in it it was less than two wow. months now, i'm hearing you're 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 visualizing not how to do it right no you're, you're visualizing i'm it's visualizing the result i feel like my i had an like an issue where i kind of think like i'm like logistics you know like x's and o's and and numbers and stuff and i i was always too caught up in the how how am i going to do this how i'm like i don't see the numbers adding up you know but once you change to the result and already being there the how just comes to you right like you just don't worry you just there's a certain level of faith you need to have too um and, and those things just come, right? The answers just come. Like, you can't worry about the how. They talk about that. it in that first chapter or the second chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Think and grow rich, you know, where yeah. he goes to Philadelphia or whatever. And like, he has no money to do it. And he just keeps listening to his intuition the whole time. But yeah, wow. you can't focus on the how. So one common denominator with a lot of successful people is exactly what you just described. It's like, they believe that, that you can visualize what it was it called? Think into result. Thinking, thinking into results. Yeah. Thinking into results. Like that is the cheat code to a to a success for a lot of people. Like I've talked to a lot of people, like salespeople at some of our companies, and when I talk to them about like how much they want to make, like what their goal is, and this and that, they physically can't see themselves. They can't even imagine themselves making this much a month. Like they're like, oh yeah, no. Like I, I'm like that. You have right there. Don't do anything else. Focus on removing that thought from your head and, and focus on putting the putting the number into your head because you can do it, you know? And that I feel like is the cheat code to life. So like rewind what we what he, Mike just said and rewatch that and execute on that because that is the difference between successful and not successful. I, I truly, truly, 100%. truly believe that. I tested it like a, almost a year ago to the day. I took a small group of like my mastermind members. None of them were like brand new. They'd all been with me at least a year. So like they knew how to run properties, how to get properties. And we're all doing pretty good. And I put them through this like 12 week thing, like a thinking and the results that I put together. And like the results were ridiculous, man. And the only thing that we did was just change that thermostat of like what was possible hmm. and like what they could accept. And yeah. like one guy went from having like three properties to 12 in like 12 weeks. One of them wow. went from 26 to 52 in 12 weeks. Like think of wow. that, like it's insane. Like those numbers are insane. They doubled from 26 to 52 in 12 weeks. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, self-limiting belief is like the, the number it's one. A, that's it's what I feel ceiling. is the thermostat. Like uh, the, the thermostat, like when, I, when you said like the thermostat, like what I think it's like, I, it, this happens to me too. Like even if I'm on a weight loss journey or whatever, as soon as I get to like a certain point, then next thing you know, I'll start like you secretly, so, but not like consciously, like subconsciously, yeah. like starting to self-sabotage, you know, and the next thing you know, it's like, I can't get to that fucking weight, you know, like, cause I can't visualize myself like jacked with a six pack, you know what I'm right. saying? So like, if you, you know, like you get to that point where you're like comfortable, next thing you know, you're creeping back up, you know? And it's like that thermostat. It's like, as soon as it gets too hot, it's like, it goes back to 70 degrees. As soon as you get too cold, you bring yourself back up. And to break through that takes intentional work, like you're saying. And visualizing is like one of the and number one ways to do that. And it costs money too. It costs money too. Like there's an investment to that, right? Like you mentioned before that you pay like over a hundred thousand dollars just in personal development, mastermind groups, and stuff like that. I feel for, for for whatever reason, I feel like people don't want to invest money into that part of into themselves. Yeah, it's not like a tangible asset, but it's the most valuable. And highest ROI thing you can invest Because you don't look at yourself as like a ROI. Right. But if you really think about like, okay, if I change my habits to then get X results, that's your ROI. It's just hard to like right. see that in yourself. You know what I mean? Dude, the best investments I make are in the education in myself. Yeah. Like the best real estate deal that I do, say it's a two, say I double my money on a deal, 200% return. Yeah. Right. Absolute home run. If I quantify how much I've invested in just learning the specific skill set of running those properties efficiently, right? I paid, I don't know, say I paid 10 grand for a few different programs at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Dude, that led to 15K a month in less than a year and a half because I learned that skill set, which then compounds and now I'm running multi-million dollar hotel deals with that same education because the co education compounds over time. Right. Like it's an infinite return. Right. Like no real estate deal will ever touch the return that you get on an investment in a skill set. Period. Exactly. Because you can just keep duplicating. It's like being taught how to fish, not just given, given exactly. fish. Exactly.
whatever that saying is. It's some it sounds something like yeah. that. something to do with the fish and catching it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So okay, and I don't want to get back too much into the details about like the actual visualization four times a day, but you said you have like a certain uh, music that you play, yeah. right, with your AirPods in, and are you like? sitting up with your eyes closed or are you like staring at like the number on the screen? No. Remember you I'll, said you made the screen? I'll sit just like this. Yeah. And I'll just relax, take a few deep breaths. Big thing is just relax. Like yeah. you should enjoy it, honestly. Yeah. And just relax and then close my eyes and then I'll just see it in my head. Yeah. It's interesting. Like if you look at the kids running around, yeah. their imaginations are amazing, dude. Yeah. Right. Incredible. Right? But like they kind of beat that out of us over time. Stop daydreaming. Snap out of it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that's the secret right. is going in there and seeing it up here first. So like I watch Caden and, you know, all the kids run around the neighborhood and I'm like, I need to be more like that. Yeah. And that's how you actually manifest more stuff. Yeah. yeah. Think like a kid. I've actually heard one of our one of our buddies who's super successful says that, too. And it sounds crazy, you know, but once like you reach that level of awareness that like that's the cheat code, like you said, and go all in shit starts. You know, that's when the quantum leaps happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. All right. So now, okay. So now you've been building up your portfolio of, uh, you know, you have about a hundred of these Airbnbs that you're doing and now you're focused on, um, doing like the licensed hotel deals, right? So you have that one up in, um, in, uh, Rockport. Yeah. That one's killing it right now. You're working on another one, a yep. big, beautiful one, yep. uh, in Salem mass, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah. So there's actually a third one. Mm. I don't own the third one. Uh, my business partners bought that one and they asked if I would manage it for them. Yep. So that's a 20, 21 unit in Beverly mm. that we run over in North Beverly. That one's been doing well. And now this is a 57 unit in Salem. We bought it. Took a while to get this thing over the line, but we closed on it a couple of days after Christmas. Yeah. Um, heavy reno. Yeah. Heavy reno. So yeah. it's, there's two buildings. One of them was built in the nineties. It's got good bones and we're just doing cosmetic new floors, new bathrooms, a lot of cosmetic stuff. The other building is built in the seventies and needs a complete <laughs> gut. Right. So that one demo's almost done, but that one's getting ripped to the studs and completely rebuilt. Yep. Um, people ask me all the time, like, where do you find these deals? It's all relationships. Commercial real estate is an insider's game. It really is, huh? It's an insider's game. If any anything that you find on the MLS has been picked over by like 40 investors. Yeah. Because the way that the game works is the... Somebody goes to sell a property, they call their broker. That broker is going to go through their phone and be like, all right, who are the players that are interested? Right. And they're going to send it to them first. And if nobody wants it, then it's going to go online. Right. So where single family everything goes online and try and create bidding wars commercial totally different space right so like my partner pete and pavel both of them have been following up with the previous owner for five years to get that deal wow so and they just, reached out to them like originally saying hey if you ever want to sell and they've just know. been continuing that conversation and then you know the previous owner had some personal issues and they were like all right it's time like i'm ready to let it go and um that's how we got the deal. Wow. So beautiful location. Love mint, the property. Mint. It's going to be awesome when it's done. Um, it's a lot of work. In the yeah. Meantime. But one of the things that makes your guys' property so unique, it's not just like a regular hotel. You guys do like a themed everything, right? And Kristen's like she amazing it. at design. Like really, I've seen like a, I know you um, have a, a property or an Airbnb near or in Orlando, right? Near Disney. Yeah. I mean, that thing is like better than being at Disney World. I mean, it's like. It's like a resort. It's like a resort, like themed rooms. Everything's just like a theme. It's not just, yeah. you know, put it up, throw some furniture in there and throw it on Airbnb. Like that's one of the secret sauces that you guys have, right? Yeah. And so the design is going to be killer. And then we're going to do, I think we're going to start off with like eight themed rooms. So mm. like one of them. We're thinking it's going to be like a dungeon. It's like you walk in there, it feels like you're in a dungeon. Right. Like, no, I'm not talking just like, well, I'm talking like you're going to feel like you're in a dungeon. Right. Like, it's <laughs> going to awesome. look sick. And this is because we're in Salem, not because exactly. you got like a weird fetish. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So we're in Salem. You know, we're in get, Salem. Uh, so we'll have some yeah. like kind of like witch type themed. We're going to do like a haunted glow in the dark forest one. That's going to be pretty dope with like That's trees awesome. coming out of the wall. Like, it's going to look sick um, because nobody else does that. No. And so it's like, how do, how do I... How do I do something, look at an industry like the hotel industry, and how do I reinvent the wheel? How do I turn this on its head and do it better yeah. and like make it fresh? So yeah. obviously one's the design, 
Two's the self check in. Nobody wants to go to a desk and wait for a key. Right. Yeah. Like all of our properties, it's self check in. They get their own unique access code. It only works from check in to check out. We've got 24 7 concierge people need it, but nobody wants to wait for a key. Like right. that's just archaic and dumb. Right. So, like, just kind of taking what we learned from the Airbnbs and the short term rentals and applying all those processes and software and automation to the hotel space, you give a better guest experience. You can charge more with the design and the refresh, and then you decrease your expenses. And do, that's how you get these crazy valuations because yeah. you're just really jacking up your net operating income, which is how commercial real estate's valued. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. I can't wait for that. Right? It's gonna be, Isn't there like a haunted house or something in the basement? I, so I there's. I think we're gonna do like a haunted walkway in the basement because it's like a bunker down there. I don't know why, but <laughs> right. the, all the buildings are connected. Like yeah. There's like an underground tunnel way that we could make a sick haunted walkway. In the, that's awesome. In, in the fall. So that's awesome. So now, you know, Salem, obviously that's what it's known for. You're theming that right. Disney, obviously that, but like if you're looking for yourself, if you're an investor out there, right. And you want to get into Airbnbs, like, is there any tips that you can give on like, you know, how to identify a market, you know, what to stay away from anything like that? The, the mistake that I see two biggest mistakes I see most people make one is they don't run the numbers hmm. like they just a real estate agent's like hey this property should bring in 100 grand and you know expenses will probably be like 20 grand and they just take that and run with it yeah and then they dm me later and they're like hey i'm losing money i'm like i know because you didn't run the numbers right so like you got to run the numbers um i'll i'll shoot it to you after i'll give you my deal analyzer for anybody that wants it hmm. so because like by far the amount of dms that i get from people that don't know how to run the numbers is ridiculous Wow. Do you so, use AirDNA? Yep. AirDNA and STR Insights. So yeah. I've got like, again, a bunch of free trainings on how to do all that, but you have to know your numbers, especially now where we're like at the top of the market and nobody really knows. Most likely prices are going to come down if interest rates stay where they are. Right. So like you don't want to be caught holding the bag. Right. So like, <laughs> you know, if, if your property doesn't perform well, you're not going to be able to unload it because you overpaid for it. Right. Like that's the worst case scenario that you don't want to be in. And honestly, as we've looked at Airbnb, um, like um, investments, everyone tries to overprice it because of the income yeah. that's potential there for I'm a short-term rental. I'm not buying an rental. Airbnb on a cap rate formula. Thank it you. It ain't happening. Exactly. So a lot of these people will try to sell like, oh, well, you can, you know, it's bringing in this much. Well, that means I need to overpay for this. What happens if something happens in that market? I just overpaid for this property. You know, so yeah. you need to be disciplined when you yeah. buy. That doesn't. So, so you're saying when you buy, it needs to work as a regular rental property too? That would be ideal, but... I mean, my place in Orlando, there's no way. I mean, it's an 11 bedroom house. Yeah, the there's market, no, the market's good enough there. Like yeah, that. you're confident. I've yeah. heard great things about the Airbnb market in Orlando the past couple of years. You just got to put your nuts on the line and spend the money to make it look sick. There's 37,000 competitors in my zip code. <laughs> wow. In Orlando? 37,000. So like, yeah, I mean, if you, you want to compete, yeah. if you, if you want to <laughs> compete, like we spent... And again, I'm not saying that you have to spend these kind of numbers, but when I did my research yeah. for like six weeks, I analyzed every one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom, six bedroom, all the way up to like 14 bedroom houses in these specific zip codes. And what I found was after you got over 10 bedrooms, that's when the revenue really popped. Hmm. And that's where the spread started to really work. And then I went deeper and I was like, okay, what communities do the best for these property sizes? What are the top performing properties in these communities look like? And they all had these crazy ass themes. So I was like, okay, how can I do that? And when I say themes, I'm not talking like wallpaper. I'm talking like I've got tube slides and custom like beds in there that were built by Disney engineers. It's like a resort in that house. Yeah. That's cool. No, you gotta look the, it up. Yeah. So crazy. like the cash on cash return is like 30% on that deal. Wow. But we put like 200 grand into the reno. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so if, if I had scaled that back and it didn't stand out as much, I wouldn't have gotten booked like it's gotten booked. It's almost yeah, like you, you have to go all in. You on got that it. Idea. You got if, not, if you half ass it, it's not going to get the retention return. That, that from that the client. Well, especially in a market like that. But that's like, you know, you hook up with a, like an expert like like Mike before you don't just jump in. You know, like yeah. you need to really you see the amount of analysis he was doing before he right. made that investment. It was granular down to like the bedroom, you know, looking at the top performing ones and how to, you know, having that 11th bedroom you know, put you over the map. You know, someone like us who doesn't understand the market doesn't, right. you know, if you just jump in, you're like, okay, I got a three bedroom, it's 500 grand for this property. It's going to bring in this much. Yeah. And you just, 
like not knowing the numbers, not knowing the market. Right. You know, good news is there's people like him out there that, that have already done it. Exactly. That could teach you how to do it. Exactly. And that's, that's the beauty of investing into yourself in a mastermind. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's also one of your businesses is you teach other people, you do it yourself. And then you're also teaching other people how to do it. Yeah. Which yeah. is, which want, is invaluable. I, I mean, that's an incredible investment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how did you segue into like, so I always, I always, that first mastermind, they had us do, I forgot what it was called, but it was basically like, what are your gifts? Right. It was like, I think it's called sacred gifts. Like, what are your sacred gifts? And one of mine is like knowledge. Like I like to learn things. And the other, the big one was teaching. Yeah. So even before I took that, I just assumed one day I was going to retire as a college professor. Cause I've always liked teaching and I've always been into books and learning and whatever. And so my mentor asked me, when I was in my mid twenties, he was like, if you were making like 10 million a year passively and you never had to worry about money again, what would you want to do with your life? And I said, I'd be teaching financial education hmm. because I spent all this money on schooling and colleges and all this stuff. I got my CPA license for Christ's sake. Hmm. Nobody ever taught me through formal education how to become financially independent yeah. ever. And I said, I'm going to dedicate my life to that. Hmm. And that's basically what I do. I'm just teaching that through this vehicle of short term rentals. Right. And so like, I love it. That's where I spend 95% of my time is on the teaching. I've got all the operations dialed in and I've got my team running all that stuff. Right. But between running the mastermind, I've got a boardroom now for higher level folks doing the hotels. I've got my event STR wealth conference in Nashville next month. Hmm. I, I just, I love the teaching and the podcast and like, it's just fun for me. Like if, even if I wasn't making money, I would do that. Yeah. Like I just love teaching That's and doing awesome. stuff like this. Yeah. That's awesome. That's an important thought. If you think like if money really wasn't a thing. Yeah, I, what like, would I you, like how you frame that. It's like what I, would you like yeah. what would you be doing? And why would you be doing it? It's a good you know, question. like for me, like I have obviously an, I have an obsession with animals, right? So if money like wasn't a thing for me, like I'd be like rescuing dogs and you know, talking about all this stuff, me personally, right? I mean, and I know you're different. What would I do? I think I would I don't just know. lay on a fucking beach in Aruba and that's it. Yeah, like, like selling. I, that's I don't think you. Purpose. I don't think you can selling coconuts. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> no, no. I say that, but you think so? I no, think we have, we have just... a, we have a an image of the guy a Leatherman. Yeah, we Do you want to explain Leatherman. who Leatherman is? Leather. You know, like when you go away to like a like a, a an island, Aruba. There's always like one guy who's you can just tell is like. His skin is turned to leather. Just from <laughs> yes. And he's always has a pot belly. And he's always fat. Yeah. Always. always fat. And he's just got like a tan line under his tits. Yeah. yeah. Right? He's just, he's the mayor though. He's, he's like the exactly. mayor. Of, and he's yeah. got a tiny like speedo, like a speedo yes. on, right? Like just shouldn't be having a speedo on. That's my goal. That's Angelo's visual <laughs> vision. Like when yeah. you say how to like to visualize, like that's the visualization. I am not, I am not visualizing that. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all the questions I was asking on how to visualize it, like yeah. that's where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. So I got to picture myself. Like, I know there's no smell of suntan lotion because we don't need it. We need to be fucking dark. Lutra, what would yeah. you do? Dried up. What huh? would you do? If money wasn't a thing, what would you like? Honestly, I don't know. I, I, I get a lot of like, you know, I, I feel good teaching too. Like I like, that's what makes me feel good. Like building, really? building other people up. Yeah. yeah I, you're good. At, you know, you like building teams. Yeah. So yeah. I guess that's like that. Yeah. I like to see things like working too. Like when you, when you put the right people in the right places and it like just creates that fusion of like something different because it's the right combination of people, you know, yeah. like, I don't know. Just you know like what? Things. I think I, I think I might, you know, like I like, like the people around me, I want, like, I want them to do good. Yeah, 100%. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're, you're like a I, huge heart, huge heart. Yeah. Like that's what I want. Like somebody asked me, because, you know, like the mega millions of Powerball was like billion dollars, whatever. They're like, what would you do with that money? And I honestly, I thought about it. Like, I guess like I was visualizing that, I guess, a little bit. Like, what would I have done? I would go to every employee that we have that's been with us for a long time. And I would I would give them like a million dollars a year each, like in a salary. You know? Yeah, you've said that to me before, too. Have I? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if I just thought like I would. That's what I would do with that. I wouldn't take it and like. Yeah, I would literally just make sure everybody that works for us is like financially, yeah, like like free, like they work because they want to at this point, not because they have to, and then you know, and then just improve everybody's life. Like that's what I would do. So I think maybe I would be on that and like yeah. the teaching and helping other people get to where we. I mean, they there's want to get major, to. there's major purpose with that. Major. Once yeah. you start like helping other people and seeing development and and seeing how thankful and appreciative, like there's a huge piece, like a human element to that. Yeah. How deep that hits. I when think somebody they, comes up to you and tells you that like you changed their life, yeah. like there's no amount of money that could touch that. Right. And have you seen a lot of success? Like someone came in like 
with no real experience. They just have like the the dream that they want to do something with this as a vehicle to become independent. Like, have you brought in people from that oh, point yeah, to, to hundreds at this point? Really? I've been teaching this since 2019. So wow. like now I have three coaches that like coach with me. Yep. All of them have homegrown, come through the program, gotten to at least 20 K a month in rental income. Wow. And now they come back and they coach because they like to coach. Like you said, yeah. like they just love the coaching. Awesome. And it's like, that's the, that's the best part, dude. Like hands down. It's just like seeing, cause I just know how I felt. Like I just felt stuck, man. And you just kind of feel a little helpless of like, who do I need to ask? Like, what is the plan? And I didn't know anybody, you know, growing up that could like show me that plan. Yeah. That's awesome. And you were able to put it in your head and then make it happen. <laughs> Which is, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways from this is like the yeah. visualization and like really truly doing everything that you're learning with with extreme intent, you know, and action like actionable. What you learned at that event or in that book, don't read a hundred books. Find three or whatever that mm-hmm. you and and actually do what you saw did uh, read in the book. Right, that that is like that's the like a huge takeaway. Right. Another, another takeaway is Airbnb is a great market. Yeah. I think Airbnb a great, is a yeah. great avenue for that. You know what I'm saying? And you're a great vehicle to start with. Exactly. In, in terms of mastermind and getting that education. I mean, yeah. I think that's a no brainer. Right. Any markets, like just for people out there that are looking like, I know Nashville's one, like Scottsdale, Orlando, like those, like the big three. So Nashville has a lot of regulation. So, like, I, I personally wouldn't touch Nashville unless you can. It goes back to what we talked to somebody that has one of those permits that they're not giving out anymore. Those houses sell at a premium because their scarcity is only so many with permits and you're dealing with bachelor and bachelorette parties every fucking day, which for me, I don't want to deal with personally. Um, (laughs) It's kind of a loaded question. One of the, one of the softwares that I really recommend is called STR insights Hmm. and a a buddy of mine came up with it. He's an, he's an investor and he was a data analyst guy. So like he came up with a way to analyze the whole country, basically doing what I did in Orlando. Yeah. It does it for you. And I was like, where were you two years ago? Bro? Yeah. You <laughs> saved me six weeks of my life. Yeah. But like you can look up markets or just filter the entire country on for small, medium or large markets and filter it by return. So he'll pull in the appraised values of all these properties plus what they brought in for revenue on Airbnb and Verbo and do a little calculation. So you can filter by markets with the best returns. You gotta that's go a level, cool. you gotta go a level deeper than that, but yeah. for like a quick sniff test and narrow your focus, that's what I would suggest. Oh. And then just think to yourself like, dude, I've got I've got properties in five different states. I got students globally at this point. Like if, if it's legal, it works. Yeah. So like, where would you wanna go? Like that's the bigger question right. to ask yourself. Like right. you you can build this business anywhere. Where would you enjoy doing it? Right. Like how's Aruba? Any idea? I don't know. You like Aruba though, huh? Yeah, I'm a big Aruba guy. <laughs> I think Angel we can make I think Aruba. we can make that happen. Yeah, yeah let's then, do that. And then yeah. You can, you can even go an extra step and you can like welcome the guests in your little mankini. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just be, you have to come to the, the beach to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you can go Angel's an Aruba guy. I'm a Florida guy. I love Florida, man. After we bought that house, Florida I tried to get Kristen to move. She was like, not having it. Yeah. Do. I think one day. Yeah. I get a question like uh, about the f- like financing on Airbnb. I know it's like a, a granular question, but we were looking at it, you know, and it's it's not like traditional financing, right? Like you can't, you can. the numbers don't necessarily work for regular uh, rentals sometimes, right? So in, in that case, what do you do? You just need more money down or do you have to find special banks? that? No. So there's like, there's banks out there that specialize in short-term rentals. So like, that the one in Florida, I still hadn't been out of my job for two years. So I wouldn't qualify for, for traditional financing. Yeah. So there's a product called like a DSCR loan. Debt service D-S-C-R? coverage. DSCR? DSCR. Debt service coverage ratio loan. Okay. And what they do is they look to see, okay, they'll pull in, they'll get reports from AirDNA. Yeah, we talked to uh, Angel, we, we talked to a bunch of guys in that in the beginning. Yeah. So that's how I got that deal. They don't even look at my income, they don't even pull my They're credit. just looking at the asset. They look at the asset, how much are they confident that this thing would bring in? And then they give you a loan based on that. I and see. I was able to get a 30 year fixed loan, 375. You're shit, 20, man. 20% down. Then who the fuck were we talking to? A scumbag from yeah, Georgia. Yeah, like 50% down, like 15%. Yeah, scumbag like, right, from Georgia. No, I don't know. I got you guys. We'll talk offline. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. So, all right. So, basically, you might pay a little higher interest than the traditional. I paid some points to buy that rate down. Yeah. Because, like, normally you're going to pay, like, two points to do a deal like that because it's it's just a non-QM type of product. Right. So, I think I ended up paying a good amount in points. But when I did the math out, 39 months, I'll be in the black. Mm. So, so, like, when I did the math of, like, okay, I think it cost me, like, $39,000 in points. Right? So, But then I looked at my monthly payment difference from buying it down versus not buying it down. And I want to keep this property for a long time. I love it. Yeah. So it was like within 39 months, that 39K comes back to me and then it's all upside from right. there, yeah. if that makes sense. Yes, yeah. especially if you're in a, you're going to be in for the long term. Exactly. And you're happy with that rate. If I was trying to get in and out, I wouldn't have done that. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because it wouldn't have made sense. But. Right. Or if you were going to refi in a few years or whatever, right? Because that 375 is locked for 30 years. Yeah, that's a good rate. That's a real good rate. Yeah, right and now. it's cash flow and it's cash flowing like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So what's next for you? Like, what's the what do you have any any goals this year? Anything you're visualizing? What are we What are we doing? So um, we closed on that hotel. Yeah. I want at least one more hotel this year. Yep. Yeah. And I want another luxury property in the community next to mine in Orlando because it's got three golf courses on that mm. community. So I'm gonna buy something down there. I want at least one other hotel. I already checked off one. We sold out our thousand person event next month, two months in advance. Congratulations. Uh, so That's next, awesome. Next That's year we're going to go to 2,500 people. Wow. So, wow. So you bring in guest speakers along with yourself. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Speaking, man, that's, you know, and I know you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you were shy, like growing up or whatever. And to be able to go stand in front of a thousand people and speak is no, no easy feat, my friend. But it, I worked on it too. Yeah. Like I did Toastmasters for a couple of years. I, Invested in some public speaking courses. Um, it's just practice, man. Yeah. I was terrified for the first 30 seconds on that stage last year. And then I just like felt at home. So it you did awesome. your first one. It was last year, your first one. Yeah. So the first time speaking in front of that many people. Yeah. Man. I, I Sometimes I. Like for I three see, days. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm oh my God. For three yeah. days. That's tough. So, but it was awesome, man. It was It was amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So now, so the goal is you want to, you know, so you, you booked that one out and now you want to you want to scale that as well. I want to fill a stadium within the next five years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You will. Yes, you will. Like, that's that's the big goal. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So this is great. Any, okay, last question. Um, what is, like, the best advice you can give, uh, you know, that you got in your, in your life, you know, or that you can pass on to, uh, to the people listening? Man. So many, so many good, so yeah. much good advice from some amazing mentors. I think the biggest thing is you will never outperform your self image. Boom. Boom. Clip that one. <laughs> Clip it, Costa. Yeah, that's a bomb. Clip it. All right. So where can people find you if, they, if they're interested in learning about, um, you know, they want to listen to your podcast, maybe your mastermind, you know, where are you on Instagram, TikTok, where are you at? Yep. We're all over the place. So it's at the Airbnb guy. Um, I'm probably going to change that to just my name in the near future. Yeah, I kind of like the Airbnb guy. It's good. The problem is, is a lot of these fake bot accounts. So if, yeah. if somebody messages you trying to get money out of you for crypto, it ain't me. So yeah. Yeah, don't, exactly. get, don't send them shit. Yeah. Um, or you go to strsecrets.com, like short term rental, okay. strsecrets.com. I got some free training. You can find all the podcasts on there. Um, we're on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, all over the place. Um, working on the YouTube channel right now. So nice. We're all over the place. That's awesome. And then I know you said you had that um, that tool that you said that people could, uh, if they reach out, that you'd be able to share with them, like how to yeah. analyze a deal. Go to strsecrets.com slash resources. Okay. I got a bunch of free trainings, my deal analyzer, how to use Air DNA. Um, That's It's awesome. just like a little starter pack. It's called my starter pack. Perfect. So. Then we'll put the link in the description somewhere in here so people can get to you. But uh, this is great. Really informative. Learned a lot. We're going to start investing into Airbnb. By like next week, we're going to have like... <laughs> Airbnb is exactly. a hotel. Yeah. And we're going to start visualizing myself with like a very, very dark, uncomfortable tan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. That's the show. Good episode. All right.